Welcome back, everyone, to the NASA SITSI Leader Series and to this third event in our sequence on making NASA citizen science more anti-racist and more inclusive. And special thanks today to Jennifer Shirk, Rihanna Putnam, and the Citizen Science Association, who is the co-sponsor of these events. Whether you're a NASA civil servant, a NASA grantee or contractor, or someone not yet affiliated with NASA, we're glad you're here and we welcome your participation. Our keynote speaker today brings her experience both as a scientist using inclusive science communication in her work and as a lecturer who helps teach others about the value and practices of inclusive science communication. Rakib Tesfaye is finishing her PhD in neuroscience at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. She is studying sleep disruption in adolescents with other developmental conditions. She's the founder of the podcast Broad Science, which features the voices and perspectives of people who are underrepresented in science. She's the co-founder of both ComSciCon CAN, an annual science communication workshop for STEM grad students in Canada, and Black in Neuro, a community that celebrates Black excellence in neuroscience-related fields. She's even advised the Canadian government. We are extraordinarily lucky to have her with us today to share her perspectives on inclusive science communication. Welcome, Rakib. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and for the invitation, um, Sarah and Jennifer. It's been, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for this session and I, and I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, today's talk, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, being intentional about inclusive science engagement in the spaces that you're working in. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussions afterwards to see how it could best be applied uh, to, your, to your situations and your projects. And I just want to start off by um, how I got involved with science communication. And so, as Sarah mentioned, um, I started Broad Science, and this was during my master's, um, with a few other peers, a few other graduate peers. Um, and the reason for why we started Broad Science um, was to address the lack of diversity, not only within our scientific programs and, and, and within visibly within science um, uh, at large, but it was really to also address the lack of stories um, from communities that we grew up with, the lack of, of, of um, representation within those stories about how science has impacted them. Um, and so we went on to create the Broad Science Organization by um, starting off with audio documentaries in which uh, the narratives uh, were led by the voices in our communities that were underrepresent underrepresented. So we uh, started working at a local community radio station, um, knowing nothing about radio and thinking uh, that we could be expert podcasters. Uh, we were in for a harsh reality there, but we did it. Um, and what we were able to do was uh, have this beautiful community of um, different experts, which I'll talk about a little later on, but um, we had folks in the communities, we had uh, people who had been working in the sciences for uh, many decades come together to create stories that were representative, again, of communities that we were not hearing and seeing in the media. We then expanded it to youth programming. So we would work um, in various areas, particularly in underserved areas in our communities um, to and work with youth, um, introducing them to diverse scientists uh, here in Montreal. Uh, and then they would have a, a, a one whole, whole day workshop where they got to be science uh, journalists and interview these scientists on the radio. Um, and, and then we also expanded to having storytelling nights where we would get our diverse community of scientists and, and folks impacted by science uh, to get up on stage at a virtual reality event um, to, tell, to tell true stories about science and, and, and to kind of bridge that gap between um, the public and, and who they saw as scientists people working in the sciences, kind of, uh, you know, break that barrier between this uh, this picture that a lot of folks have of us being in an ivory tower. Um, and so all of this stems from this want and need to be a part of a community that was not there um, when I was a graduate student. And so um, I just want to emphasize here that a lot of science communication and a lot of science engagement um, comes from grassroots 
uh, origins. They come from a need from specific individuals uh, to create spaces that were not there. And so I just wanna share that with you from uh, my background and where I'm coming from with science communication. And that has since expanded uh, to, to various different forms of science engagement, which I'll talk about. So um, I had asked uh, folks to put in a few words that resonated with them when they heard the term inclusive science communication or inclusive science engagement. I'm just going to briefly share uh, some of the words that came out. Can you see, can you see this word cloud? Okay, perfect. Um, and so here, uh, I, I see a few words. This is great that we're going to be talking about. So multilingual, uh, no jargon, uh, different languages, again, multi, uh, multilingual coming out here, um, being culturally competent and being reflexive, this is great. Um, and so a lot of these different terms, uh, you know, something like being multilingual uh, and, and having no jargon are kind of tools to making science communication more accessible. Now there isn't one standard definition of what inclusive science communication is, but if you had read the inclusive state of science communication report that was sent to you in an email, um, there is one definition that these authors propose, and I put it up here on the slide, which is that science communication approaches uh, that intentionally, or inclusive science communication rather, are approaches that intentionally center diverse voices and identities especially those that have been and or remain marginalized in STEM practices, research, training, and engagement, including but not limited to race, ethnicity, age, ability, gender identity, sexuality, and citizenship status. And so here I've highlighted the word intentional um, because here, um, you know, we want to frame inclusive science communication with groups in mind that have been historically excluded and underrepresented from the type of work that you do. And so again, this is just uh, another, another reminder to check out the amazing resources um, of the Metcalf Institute Inclusive Science Communication um, Symposium and Practices because pretty much everything that I'm gonna be talking about, they've written in a much better and eloquent way. Uh, so please check that out. Something that I want to just remind everyone about is that science communication is central to our democracy. It has many benefits, you know, in including increasing innovation, increasing our collaborations and partnerships, uh, you know, helping us get funding and impact. Um, but at its crux, at its core, you know, we need, to, we need to realize that it, it's that access to science and engagement with its output um, and its impacts is a democratic right that people have. And so I will be highlighting a few approaches um, we as scientists can take uh, to make science engagement like the citizen science project or the community science projects that you're working on inclusive and equitable. And, and as I mentioned, most of these points are in the inclusive SciComm kit. And so the first, the first thing that needs to be done is self-reflection. <laughs> um, so reflecting on your own identity, your lived experience, your privileges, your expertise, this will help you understand some of your motivations for engagement and your biases that, that you may have. Um, so for me, I understand that broad science was created um, because of a need that wasn't, uh, wasn't fulfilled, was a need for community, right? Um, so, so being cognizant of, of, of your motivations um, and of course the potential biases that come along with that. And so one lens um, for which you can think about your connection to science and I emphasize to science within a dominant Western cultural context is through science capital. And so uh, this is a concept that taps into our science literacy, our attitudes and values, engagement uh, with STEM in everyday life, um, and for youth at home. And so for scientists, uh, this link to science capital, as you can imagine, is quite high. Um, 
And so, you know, you can reflect on some of these questions here on the, uh, the bottom right. Um, and some of these questions uh, are, are different for kids, of course, when, when trying to measure science capital. But, you know, just reflect and think about, has this always been the case for you? Have you always had a, a high sense of science capital, um, you know, growing up? Um, so it, research shows that uh, youth who have a high science capital tend to be, uh, have a greater positive perception of STEM. Um, they feel that they have some sort of science identity, that they aspire to be working within the STEM force. But then we also know that these youth tend to be boys and they also tend to come from socially advantaged backgrounds. And so here you might wanna reflect on are you only engaging people with this high affinity or high connection to science culture in the, West, in the Western context? And this leads us to reflecting on who we invite to collaborate and participate in our science engagement and where does this engagement occur? Um, so I created a, a reflection tool called the Perspectives Compass. Um, and this was for my students to think about the voices that they were including in their media stories. And I think this can be adapted to science engagement. Um, and this is, this is just a tool for reflection. We're not gonna do it now. I just wanted to show you that these are things that you can take a piece of paper and reflect on. So in your own time, um, you know, try to name as many people, places, and things who are involved and might be impacted by your project or could benefit from it. And then once you have those, as we refer to them, stakeholders, you know, start jotting down what are some of the perspectives that they may have? Um, how might they be impacted or benefit from your project? And importantly, what you can start to do is circle those perspectives that have been invited to shape your project. Who are the most represented in your space, in your project space? And this can provide you with the direction um, for who you can start engaging with and begin partnerships with those stakeholders that you have yet to involve. So, Maybe this is a school that's closest to your field site, or maybe this is a, a, a group of, or a co-op of farmers whose crop will be impacted by the pollutant factors that you were studying. So whatever that looks like for you, I think it's really visually helpful to see who are you currently engaging with and who are you missing out that can benefit from not only participating, but providing you with input. Now, before engaging and creating these partnerships, um, we need to reflect on the spaces that you will be inviting them into. So what is the historical context, the power dynamics that will be at play? Um, you know, as an example, uh, here, here is a, some quotes from a, a research paper that was published um, on the perceptions of science communication spaces like museums um, by individuals largely from African descent. Um, and so I'm just gonna read out two of the quotes um, that I pulled from this paper. Um, so Abdu, one of the research participants said, you know, when you start thinking of going out, the science museum or a museum is the last place you would think of. Even if you were doing a list of a hundred places that you wanna go, you could not connect with it. And Hawa, another participant says, because in reality, a lot of Africans have done a lot of things that are good in the world. But most of the time when people are talking about history, when you think about science in the museums, they are forgotten. And so here, I wanna emphasize that even if you make some of these spaces accessible, they can be unwelcoming and they can even be physically unsafe. And I know that Liz will expand on this with regards to field sites in her talk. And so, rather than trying to engage and get people to belong in spaces that have not been 
historically have not been created with them in mind um, or with them, I would invite you to start thinking about how you can reimagine these spaces with them. And this involves co-creating projects rather than showing up with one and saying, here's the final product and that's it, right? And so I just want to highlight here that co-creation has been used for decades in health research. So you might've heard of terms like knowledge translation. And so uh, this is about raising uh, knowledge users awareness of findings and facilitating those findings. And when I talk about knowledge users, I'm talking about stakeholders. So people that can use or be impacted by research products. So, you know, not just patients, this could be policymakers, for instance. Um, and here in Canada, uh, our, our version of the NIH, we use the term integrated knowledge translation. And that refers to engaging stakeholders as true partners in the research process. So in, in the creation of knowledge and the implementation of the knowledge itself. Um, and this can mean community-based engagement. This can mean patient engagement. There's so many different terms um, <laughs> that are used. I won't go through it, but all this is to say is that there are frameworks for how to engage individuals and communities with projects. They're just in a, di a different discipline. <laughs> so, you know, why? Why would we uh, facilitate this co-creation? And so, uh, as an example, uh, so I would just, in, in, my, in my field and in, in health and patient engagement um, that I work in, we know that the relevance of our research, the quality of the data that we collect and the applications of the finding into real world settings is positively impacted when patients are closely involved with the research process. The research just works better. And we have decades of evidence to show, to show this. And so for me, I, um, in addition to doing, as Sarah mentioned, my uh, sleep neuroscience research, I also work with autistic youth and parents and ethicists to develop better communication methods so we can understand youth perspectives. And so, you, you know, it, it almost seems like a no brainer. Like why wouldn't autistic youth be included? They are experts in the way that they communicate. They, their expertise can help us understand how, uh, understand what research questions we're missing out on or how to modify our protocols. And so similar, similarly in the science communication world, um, we need that bi-directional engagement. We need opportunities um, that facilitate mutual learning uh, between scientists and community members and members of the public. Um, and in, in broad science, for instance, we, we, we view our youth participants as experts. They are asked how we can improve our programming, you know, what we need to do uh, for the next time. Uh, they're also asked about their interests. So if someone is telling me that they're interested in astronomy, I'm not gonna rock up with the marine biologists. I'm gonna to listen to them, right? And I'm gonna try as much as I can to tailor the program based on consulting these youth, these experts who know what they're interested in. <laughs> so there, there are many frameworks that can be used. Um, and as I mentioned, social sciences and public health, they have been in the participatory based engagement game for a long time. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel you can turn to these other fields um, to understand how to better implement co-creation into your projects. Um, but this part of, part of this co-creation means thinking about who is an expert. And so traditionally we default to experts as being the scientists. And if co-creation is going to work, you need to be able to see the other stakeholders, the participants that you're engaging with as experts as well. And, 
trying to engage them as early on in the process um, is going to facilitate that inclusivity within your project even more. And I'm not gonna, uh, you know, in the other sides, I'll talk about how important interdisciplinary expertise is, but, you know, think about how often you draw inspiration from other disciplines. I mean, we draw inspiration from nature, right? And so this is just something that we do. Um, and I don't think, uh, and it's, it's really funny to me when I, uh, when I talk to some of our colleagues in the biological sciences, um, that there's this hesitancy uh, to, to bridge uh, into the social sciences, but I, it's incredibly important for, for these types of projects to work. Okay. So then how do you measure? How do you measure if things are working? Um, and this is, I, I have the answer or solution to this, <laughs> but I, I want to highlight that in the uh, anti-racism action group, uh, NASA's anti-racism action group, um, you've put forth a few outcomes here that you want to foster a community where everyone feels welcomed, included, and valued, right? You, there's other goals as well. I've just sure I picked this one here, but how how do you measure that? Is it with scientific papers? Maybe that could be one outcome. Um, is it with how many people engaged with your project? Okay, yeah, that could be one outcome. But there is a lot of depth that can be added into how you're measuring success. And again, that's drawing inspiration from social sciences, from the health sciences. Um, one potential outcome that comes to mind is empowerment. This is uh, an outcome that the World Health Organization uh, has talked about since the 70s. Um, and so in the health context, it's a process whereby people gain greater control over decisions and actions affecting their health. Um, and, you know, in the in the realm of science communication, we can think about how empowerment uh, can be used to decentralize power and authority um, and give agency and self-determination to the public within the scientific process, within you know, the development of scientific knowledge. Maybe you can look at outcomes like, do people feel like they belong? Are you creating new partnerships along the way? Right? Are people gaining new knowledge and new interests? There are so many different outcomes that can be measured that go um, beyond kind of the traditional how many people attended and how many people engaged. Um, and I just want to point to some tools that can be used. So the logic model here is a well known public health tool that's used to develop um, and to, to, to track outcomes. Um, that are useful to your project. Um, and the AAAS, the American Association of Advancement for Science, I'm so proud that I got that right, um, <laughs> has adapted the logic model for science engagement and uh, science communication projects. And so this is something, again, I will send all these links your way, but this is something that you can use. Again, don't reinvent the wheel. And there are multiple evaluation tools. I don't have time to go through this paper, but I'll send you a link to it. There are multiple um, uh, evaluation tools within the social sciences that can be helpful um, that have been applied to citizen science, uh, like this paper here that investigates um, a citizen science project regarding uh, wood smoke pollution in, uh, in, in communities where diverse youth lived. And I'm just gonna, point to some few, very quickly, um, other accessibility um, considerations for your projects. So something to think about here is that uh, a lot of the science that we do is under a paywall. And so how are you making your work open access, the citizen science work open access? Um, are you hosting, uh, you know, Zooms or uh, public events where people can engage with the research and the output that they that they helped with. Where is your audience? Um, you know, if you're only on Twitter, 
Um, is that leaving out individuals who aren't on social media or maybe they're on a different type of social media like TikTok? Um, of course, uh, you know, you've already mentioned bilingualism and jargon, so I'm not gonna to, to expand on that. There are some really great uh, papers that talk about um, kind of this dominance of English and how it's a, a detriment to not only uh, engaging with communities, but to, to increasing our, our scientific knowledge. Um, and then within your within your events, are you transcribing? Are you closed captioning? Are you are you a ASL friendly? Um, are you cognizant of the fact that not many people who engage will have internet access? Um, and I want to provide one really great example um, of this. And so I'm not sure if, if any of you have heard of the tactile universe. Um, and this was uh, a project, an organization that was started by astronomer and science communicator, Dr. Nicholas Bunn. And so uh, Nicholas is, is blind and he wanted to share his love for astronomy with other folks who were visually impaired. And so what he started doing was creating 3D printed tactile images of galaxies. And this could be used in schools uh, and public events. And so again, this is thinking about um, audiences that might have no never been exposed to astronomy and galaxies in the same way as folks who do have, uh, who, who are not visually impaired. Um, and so these are, these are things that we need to be thinking about. But again, remember, Nicholas, is, is part of a community. Uh, and so again, thinking about your positionality and going back to self-reflection where he knew there was a gap. And so that's why we need to be expanding, expanding and broadening who we're interacting with. So we're able to be exposed to these gaps. And very quickly, um, you know, partnerships and bridging opportunities are super key. You're not gonna be able to do this alone. Um, falling Walls Engage, I would recommend, uh, that's how I actually uh, met Nicholas, it is a wonderful global initiative of science communication activities. You can learn a lot from these individuals who are doing citizen science work around the world, including within uh, the realm of uh, astronomy and other interests of NASA. Um, so for instance, this, this uh, Columbia uh, Hypatia um, they, they are using astronomy as a tool to promote meaningful communication and culture of peace and nonviolence in areas of conflict. Um, there are many black in X different fields uh, that you could collaborate with and learn from. So black in astro, black in geoscience, black in physics. Um, if you're interested in learning more about science education and, and, and community science, um, you can turn to different resources like the Metcalf Institute, like the Center for Advancement of Informal Science Education. And here, there are also opportunities for you to get grants to bridge between the work that you're doing and the social sciences. So if you don't have that um, expendable resources to include a project coordinator or another researcher, you can apply for an NSF grant. You can apply for all these different grants. Um, so, you know, thinking about who you can partner with is really key. And I just wanted to point out, again, look at the inclusive SciComm toolkit. There are incredible resources there, including the Equity Camp Compass, sorry, um, that can help guide you in the creation of your, uh, of, of your projects. Um, I'm not going to go through this now, but this is just to say that you you have a link to this and, and you can read and you can you can you can draw inspiration from it. So this is my last slide, and I just want to um, briefly give some takeaways. I think really the first thing is to start to do something. So you know, as much as I can talk about, you know, different research and different approaches, we really need to get the ball rolling and to start. And so maybe that means not necessarily engaging with the community just yet, but maybe that means attending an event, situating yourself within the community that you're interested in. Maybe that means, uh, is there a social scientist at your institution that you could have 
coffee with or virtual virtual coffee with, um, you know, a science educator. Those are those are pretty feasible steps that can be done. Another thing that I want to highlight is that we need to make this personal. Um, so your efforts to increase inclusion, diversity, equity, justice, that doesn't just stop when you're out of work, right? Um, I really love this. Sorry, this is a, I just realized how not uh, clear this, this photo is here. But this is, a, I thought, a really wonderful tweet um, that summarizes this. So, and I'll read it out. So um, this person, Zena, I hope I'm saying their name right, is um, they said they just wanted to, just wanted to let you know that science outreach isn't just doing experiments with black and brown kids. It's also making sure that those same little kids actually get to live long enough to become scientists or whatever else they want to be. Um, so these efforts really need to be personal. Um, it takes time. Goes without saying, I think um, part of the frustrations that um, that I've had is 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 having consultations where um, groups think that this can just work, that they're going to go into uh, a partnership with an indigenous community and it's going to work well. And it's like, you know, the, these communities uh, have rightfully earned the right to be mistrustful. Um, you know, science uh, and our Western culture has stripped them of um, many different things. And so these things take time and trust needs to be earned. Um, and there needs to be humility uh, when, when we're engaging with these communities. Um, and sometimes you might not be the person who should be engaging with those communities. And I think that's actually something we don't often talk about. Um, there's an assumption that sometimes these partnerships just work, but maybe you can act as a resource in a different way. Maybe you're, maybe you're best fitted in a position where you can train some members of the community to do the work, or you can provide resources that they need. So really think about that and, and your positionality within certain partnerships. Maybe, maybe right now is not the right time for you to be there. Um, and, that, and that goes along with acknowledging your limits and your capacity. You know, don't overpromise. Um, Communities have seen helicopter researchers before. They know what it is for people to come in, get what they need and to get out. And we don't wanna do that, right? And so it can be more harmful for you to be really excited about this project and then realize you're in over your head. Uh, and then the last point that I wanna make um, is that you, you need to assume capability. And I think this comes along with um, especially the work that I do with youth. Um, these kids have so many complex conversations. I can't even, you know, it's amazing from green chemistry to CRISPR, like they have these wonderful complex conversations. And so we just need to assume that everyone is capable of being a part and creating a community, regardless of how you have perceived them previously or, or, or what you believe that their expertise level is. Um, so those are a few, a few points uh, that I wanted to leave you with. Um, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion after. And I'm looking forward to Liz's uh, talk as well. <laughs> Thank you, Rakib. That was great. And I'm glad that you're going to be sending us lots of links because you talked about so many things that seem really relevant to this conversation and exciting. I can't wait to dig in. And I look forward to the conversation we'll have after Liz. So next up, we have Elizabeth McDonald, who leads the Aurora Source Citizen Science Project, which engages Aurora observers, enthusiasts, and photographers at the top and bottom of our planet as partners in her research on space weather. She's agreed to share some of how she is learning and what she is learning as she strives to make more um, participation or make more equitable, what am I saying here? She strives to more equitably and inclusively invite and support participation in Aurora Source. Thanks, Liz, to you. <laughs> okay, all right, so I will jump right in. Sorry for taking that time. Um, 
I am going to try and follow up that great presentation by Rakib with a few reflections on the journey that our project has taken and my own personal reflections. I am not an expert. I definitely don't want to be held up as, oh, look, Liz NASA is doing these great things. Um, I'm definitely on my own journey of learning and unlearning and um, really liked that kind of uh, ladder of engagement that you had on your uh, last slide, Rakib, because, you know, somewhere uh, just getting started and but progressing. Um, and so I want to appreciate that. And uh, yes, so thank you all for bearing with me uh, while I'm talking about that. Um, and Rakib, you really gave a great introduction to the intersection with citizen science, even though you don't do citizen science, but coming from your field, it certainly is very evident how the interdisciplinary um, aspects uh, relate in a similar way that they do for citizen science. And so I know for me that I started um, on the science side and doing citizen science, we've actually had some great um, outcomes of appreciating people's expertise. And they even noticed a new type of Aurora in the sky and they named it Steve, which is a great, really accessible name. Um, and, you know, I, I have this um, appreciation for the expertise of the citizen scientists and, and some of what you were talking about. Um, but more recently, especially since 2020, uh, have thought and realized more deeply about how that has, um, you know, even though that is more inclusive than scientists in my field are typically, that's still not um, encompassing the many ways that race and systemic racism in our country are um, affecting what we're doing. And so, um, especially in 2020, our project participated in um, calls to shut down STEM with um, a day of reflective practice uh, and um, then committed to continuing to um, learn and reflect. And that's what I will try to be sharing with you a little bit more about here today. Um, we also learned from um, the uh, Black Birders Week, which was inspired by a racist incident in uh, the birding community. And we, um, from that grassroots effort, uh, really started to see parallels um, in the Aurora community. And uh, just eye-opening moments of the fact that there's a lot of privilege that goes into actually being able to chase Aurora and do so safely and that not everyone um, has the same uh, um, abilities to do so. And there's a variety of ways that privilege comes in. And this conversation was um, uh, had um, and led actually within one of the um, local Aurora communities, Aurora Borealis, Washington State. And they um, definitely uh, had a very um, pointed this out, had discussion within their group. Um, we also started talking with them, talking with our own group about um, what to do, uh, what more we can do and what to do with that real, those realizations. Um, so actually we've done a few blog posts about that. I was just looking at the first one, which is called Calling Out and Calling In. Um, it has a really good quote from um, the leader of the Aurora Borealis Washington State group, one of the admins, Debs, who um, really spoke about how privilege and race uh, affect um, Aurora chasing. So that's something people could uh, check out if they wanted. And um, then within our project, which is more global, um, we've been learning about and implementing uh, changes to make things, I would say, more accessible. Um, I would definitely not say this is uh, complete or adequate or enough. Um, there's uh, there's just been a lot of uh, learning since then. And I also want to 
um, acknowledge my project manager, Laura Brandt, who's coming from a history and museum education background. And that outside of science background has um, really translated um, into this space and been very helpful because I think many of us, I know for myself as my scientific background did not include um, enough of the other aspects that are actually important to um, being a scientist, a good scientist and human here in this conversation today. Um, so we've started uh, making better community guidelines and um, uh, trying to figure out what are more maybe family friendly Aurora viewing locations. Uh, the pandemic has made some of those partnerships, especially around land or viewing locations more um, difficult to pro uh, progress on, but um, that's something that certainly um, we will keep working on. Um, and more recently, actually, I've moved home to Washington State um, and to my hometown. Uh, and then I've been um, reflecting on, on the history here, the history of the land and the indigenous people here. Uh, and um, our project also uh, recently did a, um, hosted a cultural learning opportunity uh, with Alok Edwardson from uh, her company, Creative Decolonization. So um, that was uh, a chance for us to continue these small monthly meetings um, and really delve more into this work and how we can apply it um, to begin to uh, integrate cultural competency with daily project and science within science. Um, and that certainly, I feel like it's more complicated than many people assume, than I would have, than I assumed, um, but it's uh, really rewarding as well um, to, yeah, to to do this, to do this work and wrestle with these things, we definitely need to do more um, because we haven't done enough to uh, make progress on these these issues and diversify our fields. Um, and I can't speak for everybody's field, but I know for my own science field of heliophysics, it's definitely not been um, enough. Uh, so I have a couple more slides here. One is uh, within Aurorasaurus. If any folks out there want to join us for more smaller conversations in which um, we're actually uh, delving more into some of the tools and learning opportunities, uh, we're trying to, um, we have a few of those scheduled. Uh, and as well, um, Aluk that I mentioned, she is going to be speaking in the, um, uh, AIAN uh, Native American Network that's led by Daniela Scalise. It's a really fantastic place to learn um, more about uh, indigenous communities in particular and science, but she's going to be speaking there next month. Uh, and then we have a few meetings scheduled, um, for instance, about reading an article about um, an article that actually I think Miguel and uh, Leela shared at the beginning of this series, 10 Simple Rules for Building an Anti-Racist Lab. So that's just a fantastic article to really um, think about how, how that operates and deserves quite, I mean, all of this actually deserves a lot more time than we have here today. Um, and then we have some time to uh, set aside. We have a few more talks that we are going to be rewatching and discussing in this group. Um, one of which pertains to um, Alaska and the history of uh, exploitation of resources there um, by the scientific community specifically. Um, it's a really great talk um, that was given at a um, group started by some grads, graduate students at the University of Alaska uh, called Tech Talks. And um, also we'll be watching a talk from 
uh, by uh, Corey Erickson uh, about why it is hard to collaborate with um, and solicit buy-in from Arctic communities in particular uh, and the ways that a lot of what we do as citizen science um, does not, isn't appropriate in their um, communities. So that's a really great talk from uh, a recent um, meeting of the um, Arctic Research Consortium. Let's see. Uh, okay, so just kind of following up, that's where we're at now. There's um, something I'm following and trying to think about how it intersects with citizen science and Aurora or heliophysics are recommendations from the latest astronomy decadal survey that just came out uh, from the National Academies. And there they're talking about a community science model, uh, sorry, a community astronomy model, which is much more interdisciplinary uh, and actually taking the views of the community um, more fully into account. So that's, um, that's important for my field as well, even though there's a number of differences, like uh, for auroras, we're not talking about telescope sites or observatory sites specifically. Uh, and then I am working towards um, uh, co-creative activities in Washington and um, have been working on relationship building here and following protocols for how I could potentially um, be of service to some communities and their educational um, uh, interests. And, um, and that's, that's really rewarding as well. So that's what I wanted to share. Um, I will uh, stop that and allow some time for questions. So thanks. Thank you, Liz. That was terrific.